Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, today we have, um, of course, a wonderful presentation um, scheduled for you. We have a lot of ground to cover, but I want to jump in and tell you how tremendously excited I am for um, this opportunity to be your host and um, really kind of uh, drive some of the conversation and introduce to you some folks who are going to really be in, um, uh, going to help us through this journey today. I'd like to, uh, number one, help, uh, welcome you all to the preparing for the assessment. Um, today, we're going to talk about the high school CDA. This is the third installment of this webinar series. It's preparing the CDA assessment, a deep dive into the CDA professional portfolio. I am um, Christopher Barnes, Vice President of Impact Expansion and Partnership Development for the Council for Professional Recognition. Um, that's a lot, but again, it, it is part of the part of our rebranding of ourselves, and this is another part of our rebranding as part of the reimagining campaign. I'd like to give a few um, shout outs um, before we get started, particularly to Sandy Kowalczyk and Michelle Brown for the coordination of this event. Also want to um, shout out Dr. Bisa Lewis, who, of course, is going to be our guide today, who's always excited to share her knowledge and expertise with us. Um, we also have a wonderful group of folks who are helping us with technical assistance and with hosting this, this, um, this virtual um, environment. And so we want to definitely um, make sure we hats off and give our kudos to those folks. And of course, Dr. Calvin Moore, who is the uh, CEO of the Council for Professional Recognition, um, for him creating a space, number one, to highlight initiatives like this to support the ECE field. Um, so of course, again, today's, um, today's um, installment is really the third of this webinar series. We had a lot of um, feedback and a lot of registrants for this, so you will not be able to unmute yourselves. But we do, we are reserving time at the end of this presentation for you all to um, have some question and answer um, period. There's actually a question and answer pod as a part of the Zoom platform. So we invite you all to use that if there are any questions that pop up. And if you have any technical issues, meaning if you don't have sound or you don't have audio, um, or if you don't have video, we want to make sure that you um, have the opportunity to share that and one of our um, tech folks will be able to respond to that as soon as possible. So without further ado, that's enough housekeeping. I want to turn it over to Dr. Calvin Moore, who is our, again, our, our CEO, and he's going to give us a few informal remarks and a welcome. Dr. Moore. Thanks, Chris, and good afternoon. Welcome to the CDA community. My name is Calvin Moore, and I'm the CEO of the Council for Professional Recognition. We're so grateful that you are here. It is always top of mind for me how necessary and important uh, high quality career and technical education experiences are to the rebuilding of America's economy and ensuring that America's future is solid in the global economy. And I believe that the high school CDA career tech programs are definitely an important part of that equation. Today's presentation, as Chris has said, is our third installment of our high school CDA technical assistance webinar series. We have a brand new topic for you today, which is preparing for the CDA assessment, a deep dive into the CDA professional portfolio. I personally remember putting my poorly printed and online version of the CDA portfolio. So sit back, get comfortable, get prepared to take some wonderful notes. And there will be a question and answer period at the end. So I look forward to hearing about all of the questions that you all have as a result of this session. Enjoy the presentation and thank you for coming. Chris, I'll turn things back over to you. Thank you, I appreciate it, Dr. Moore. Now there may have been, you guys may have had some, some issues um, hearing Dr. Moore. There may be some technical issues or maybe on my side, but, um, and again, I just wanna echo that of course, he is welcoming you all to this, in, to this, to this uh, installment of this um, series. And we wanna make sure that you guys have all the information that you need. Uh, my understanding is that this, um, uh, the, web, the uh, PowerPoint will be available to you all post event. Uh, we'll make sure that you guys um, are have opportunity to have access to that. And before we go any further, I want to turn it over to um, another member of our team. Um, she is on our Impact Expansion and Partnership Development. She is one of our um, Partnership Relationship Managers, Sandra Kowalczyk. Sandy? 
Hi, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm the Partnership Relationship Manager and um, very involved in this high school CDA program and work very closely with Dr. Biza. Um, and at the end as well, if there's questions um, you know, forthcoming next week, um, my email as well as Dr. Biza's will be at the end of this presentation. Next slide. So uh, today we're basically going to explore detailed recommendations on how to prepare high school students for the CDA assessment with a focus on organizing the CDA professional portfolio, both in print and online. And the goals today are basically we're gonna review the requirements for earning the CDA credential in high school examine the competency statements and resource collection that's required for the portfolio, and discover examples and interesting processes for organizing the professional portfolio. And as Chris mentioned too, I just want to reiterate, we are tomorrow, uh, we will be sending out a copy of this entire presentation, the video, as well as a PDF of this actual presentation and some other fun links for everyone. And with no further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Biza Batten-Lewis. She has been our project consultant, um, as well as the president of the Black Child Development Institute in Atlanta. She's founder and managing partner of WINGS Curriculum and Ideal Early Learning Consulting. And she's been a trainer, a CDA trainer since 2003 as well as a former high school CTE instructor um, and ECE career pathway lead. As, and, and last but not least, she consults with school systems around the country, um, basically on ECE workforce development, in, in addition to all of her work with us here at the council, which you know we're really proud of. So with no further ado, uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Biza. Thank you so much, Sandy, uh, Dr. Moore, Chris, and all of the council team. I tell you all, it is wonderful to have a national organization who actually listens and want to learn how to implement the credential better in classrooms, uh, especially high schools around the nation. So uh, kudos to the council for having me at the table because they really do want to do this in a way that supports everyone and the workforce because we, we know we need teachers at all levels. And we definitely want them to be trained and have a standard space credential, which brings us to the best first step. The CDA is con considered to be the best first step. It is nationally recognized. I always like to add internationally because you guys, you can get a CDA in China. You can get a CDA in Ghana, in Egypt. The CDA is also international. And I think that is so wonderful. The great thing about it being nationally recognized is the high schoolers, no matter what state they graduate from high school, they can go to any state and they'll pretty much be recognized as being a credentialed uh, professional. And oftentimes, Times they can be a lead teacher in the classroom. So it's transferable and it's competency based, which is very important for the school system because you all have competencies as well, which they align and you'll find that out even more today. So uh, just a quick snapshot reminding those of you guys who have not uh, been to our webinar before, who have been to a webinar before and those who have not, these are the requirements for uh, high school students. And what's important about the CDA, we say the high school CDA often, but the CDA, the process is the same whether you are in high school or not. So let me repeat that. The process for earning a CDA credential is the same whether you're in a high school or not. So we want more high school uh, programs to implement it in the high school because many high school students who are uh, in early childhood education as their career pathway in career and technical education, you've heard of CTE or CTAE. Well, they're taking two to three years of early childhood education and they're graduating with a career pathway completion and they may get a cute little seal on their diploma. But when they try to take that to a job in early childhood education, it doesn't carry the weight that a national credential does. So the CDA is recognized. So how do you earn one? So to actually earn the credential, you must be a junior or senior in a high school CTE program. I get that question a lot about um, what training is required. These are students who are taking early childhood education in their high schools anyway, 
And we just want the educators to implement the, all the functional areas and the CDS subject areas that I remind you of today so that they can be prepared for assessment and earn the credential while they're completing the pathway. It's a win-win for everyone. So I want to clarify here about the freshmen and sophomores. Can they take the ECE classes with the CDA content? Sure. They just cannot apply for the CDA until they are a junior or a senior. So yes, yeah, start your content as early as freshman year. They have to earn 120 clock hours of professional early education. Here's the thing. If they're sitting in your class for about a, a whole year, based on how many times they come to you, usually I've found they are meeting that 120 hour requirement. Usually if they're coming to you on a regular basis. So uh, please know that many of you guys can check that box because they're already earning the 120 hours of education in your high school class. Yay! So what else? Now, this is the one I know that makes people a little uncomfortable, but it's definitely doable. And I'll discuss a little bit more about it today. They have to earn 480 hours of work experience with young children, okay, with young children. And so this has to be children who are under the who are five and under. I saw that question in the uh, Q and A already. So yeah, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, that will not count. These are infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, and they have to choose which setting. Do they want the infant and toddler CDA or the preschool CDA? And again, I'll discuss um, more about that as well. So birth to five year olds before they get to kindergarten, and they are earning um, having their experiences in the classroom with those children. Um, for the portfolio, which we're going to focus on today, and it does include family questionnaires. I saw a question already about that, so I will be discussing questionnaires today. So they have to complete a portfolio, and it's basically a collection of resources, and um, they do this during your class time. So you have to give assignments anyway. Unfortunately, we have to grade them, right? anyway. So while you're grading them, why not grade them on something that will allow them to earn a credential that they can use and directly go to work? So here's the CDA process, a reminder for many, um, maybe an intro to some. So again, whether you're in high school or not, this is the CDA credentialing process, and it is candidate driven. It is what? Candidate driven, meaning the teacher doesn't do the work for them. They do this on their own. It's candidate driven. So I want to show you how to implement it into your classroom. So during the preparation uh, phase, this is where they are doing their portfolio. They're learning the content. So they have the 120 hours of education. They're uh, learning with along with children. That's the 480 hours of direct work experience. And again, they're completing their portfolio. So that's during the prep phase. When they get ready for application, that means they are all set. They have that portfolio ready. They've earned those 120 hours of education in your class, high school instructors, CT instructors, and they have completed their 480 hours working with children. On the application, signatures, check marks, all of that's required to confirm that they have completed all of those components when you, um, as they're applying. Once the council receives your application, which can be done online or you can mail it in, but it's cheaper when you do it online, you, um, you're waiting to hear from the council and they will send what they call a ready to schedule notice. Okay, a ready to schedule notice. They cannot take their city exam or have that CDA verification visit. Nothing can happen before you get that ready to schedule notice from the council, because the council has to approve your application and show that yes, they are ready and we approve them to move forward to assessment. That's important, okay? They can't do anything after the application until you receive a ready to schedule notice from the council. So you receive your ready to schedule notice and now you are ready for assessment. Assessment happens in a couple of parts. So one is the candidate has a CDA verification visit and during the verification visit, it's about four hours or so. Uh, they're observing the classroom for a couple of hours. The CDA professional development specialist uh, has an hour or so to go over their portfolio that they have brought with them to the visit. And also they have about an hour, about 50 minutes to an hour, what we call a reflective dialogue, which is not scored. And that's along with the PD specialist and the student to discuss their goals in education, their career goals, and uh, it has parts A, B, and C. And they also get to reflect on their family questionnaires that they collected. So 
That is the actual verification visit. The other part of the assessment process is the CDA exam, which they have to take at a Pearson View site, a Pearson View site. The great thing about the council is they're full of resources and you can actually go on the council website, put it in your zip code and they will locate Pearson View sites near you. So, um, and I'll talk more about the CDA exam during this, uh, the presentation today. Here's a question I get a lot. Uh, during technical assistance, can you take uh, the exam before the visit? The order doesn't matter. So as long as you have your ready to schedule notice, it doesn't matter whether your visit happens first or you take the exam. I often tell students to go ahead and schedule their exam while you're waiting on your visit. And that way, once your scores are submitted, the PD specialist has 48 hours to get your scores in to the council after your ver verification visit. So you'll have your decision from the council much faster if you've already taken the exam. So the last thing, what ha happens? The council emails you and says, yay, you are now a national CDA. And that's the CDA process. So let's dig into it a little bit more. This is the beautiful credential, right? So this is actually a CDA credential that they receive in the mail with their name on it, and it has their setting type, infantile, infant, uh, toddler, or preschooler. Uh, so again, we'll talk more about that today. So while they're completing your pathway in early childhood education, whether it's two years or three years, it's important that they earn an industry-recognized credential. What did you say, Bisa? an industry recognized credential. This means when they go to work at a childcare center, they know what this is. It's more than pathway completion, but they can go to work with it. And again, in many states, they can also be hired as a lead teacher. Next slide. So here are the two settings I mentioned. So in high school, they get to choose between two CDA settings. There are four total. Uh, there's family child care and there's a home visitor setting as well. Um, but that is for those um, adults who are not in high school. The high schoolers get to choose from infant toddler, which is children birth to 36 months, or they can choose center-based uh, preschool. So they're doing their, uh, uh, getting their credential in a center-based uh, infant toddler or preschool. So that decision needs to be made. And here's why it's important. It's important for the CDA exam because the majority of the questions will primarily be about that setting. But it's also important because of their portfolio. They will build their portfolio around which setting they said they wanted their CDA in. Here are the books and look, new books are coming very, very soon. So uh, these are recommended books for students. Um, I tell people, instructors, CDA instructors, that it's very important to use the council's books. Why? They make the test, number one. <laughs> but also because all of the content is covered. All of the functional areas, the eight subject areas, everything that they need to know to earn their credential is covered. So it's, it's as if your curriculum was already developed for you and you're at least the content portion and you're just trying to decide what activities will I implement in my classroom using the content. All right. So curriculum is simply content and the activities or experiences. Those the content and activities come together to make your curriculum. So the council has provided you the content. All you're responsible for is the activities. Okay, the activities or experiences that children or students will engage in to learn the content. So there is a, an essentials uh, textbook. There is a student workbook as well that's already available. And again, the new ones are coming. And then you choose a guide, um, a standards guide. If you choose the infant and toddler CDA, you get the yellow book, you buy the yellow book. If you choose the preschool CDA ages three to five, then it's the green book. So um, I highly recommend for your students who, before they get to their last year of content of in your course, if your program is two years, in that second year, you're totally focusing on those standards guides because they're working on their portfolio and they're primarily working with children. In the first year, and if your program is three years, the first couple of years, they're engaged in learning the essentials information because that's more of the content and again, activities, but they're preparing their portfolio and finalizing their hours with children during that last year with you. So those standards guys, is, they're gonna be really important for the students that second year or the, whatever the last year of your program is. If you have a three-year program, it's that third year. So 
Again, I've said this, use, utilize the CD8 books, you know, hey, go ahead and adopt those. If you adopt the CD8 books, it really does make it easy for the students to understand the content. They go in there and zip, 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 and they finish those 65 questions really quickly. And they're very confident when they go sit down for the test. We know that some people uh, don't pass the test, not because they don't know the content, it's because of the, uh, the test anxiety, right? The test taking anxiety. So the anxiety is reduced when they feel confident and they have been using the materials in their classroom for the last couple of years or three years. So I wanted to share um, a simple lesson structure. And uh, those of you guys who came to our last webinar uh, that we did on uh, curriculum, this is just, it's a recap, but I wanted to go in depth a little bit more and tie this into the portfolio, which again, today I'm showing you how to do the printed one and the online portfolio. So let's say this is your lesson, right? This is your lesson. And your topic for your lesson is nutrition in child care, which is functional area two, healthy for the CDA, CDA area, CDA functional area two. And so your goal for this particular lesson is for the students to identify appropriate meal patterns for young children, appropriate meal patterns for young children. And we're talking about children who are in child care programs. So what are you going to use here? You're going to use the content that is available nationally and uh, any program who is using uh, CACFP, which is the Child and Adult Care Food Program, is under USDA. This is the content that you want your students to learn because it carries over to different states. And again, the CDA is a national credential. So you're going to have, I mentioned uh, in that last webinar about the five different lessons. So the first lesson, lesson A, is an introduction. It's an introduction. And for the introduction, you're going to have them to look at uh, the chapter three in the CDA Essentials textbook, because chapter three is unhealthy. The whole chapter is it has websites, it has uh, wonderful content to support you in uh, learning this information, your students are learning this information. But another great resource is the nutrition uh, service uh, through USDA. So you have the Food Nutrition Service website, and you also have, um, it goes to CACFP, the Child and Adult Care Food Program. So this is your content, and you can place this in your online course platform or whatever you're using for the content portion of your class. So the students can sit independently and do this. When I was a CT instructor, we were blessed enough to have Chromebooks. So they would come in and grab their Chromebook when it was lesson eight on time and they will work on their introduction. And that's after I do my announcements and introduce the lesson for today. Once they're done exploring the content on the Chromebook and they can work in groups of partners as well, then I will review the information, ask some questions. And that was our lesson for that particular day. So lesson, day might ha lesson A might happen on a Monday or a Tuesday for you. It depends on how your students come to you. And so they definitely have to have assignments, right? So the assignments for this particular part of the curriculum is they what we would have that oral discussion and then we would have an online discussion board. And again, whether you're using Google Classroom or whatever platform you use, you can post that and that's your lesson A. Uh, the next one is, um, it should be B, but it's okay, technology. Uh, examine nutrition standards. So they will examine nutrition standards for, uh, this is the second lesson, and they will focus on um, the meals and snacks, okay? So for meals and snacks, we know in Chaka they have three meals a day. They do usually do um, breakfast, lunch, and afternoon snack. Some programs who have a little more funding, they may do uh, breakfast, morning snack, lunch and afternoon snack, but there's still standards for that in, in CACFP. So they'll learn about those standards and then they'll do a reflection on best practices. The third lesson is they would explore breakfast and snack patterns only for infants, uh, for infants and young children. This is breakfast and snack only for the third lesson. And their assignment, they'll do a group activity and they'll find a healthy menu, the healthiest menu. One thing I used to do is I would bring in a, a good menu um, that met all the CACFP standards and then one that didn't. And they would have to work together and uh, highlight, circle, make notes, and determine which meals were appropriate, which ones weren't. And then we would discuss those in class. That was an activity that we did uh, in groups and as um, in large group and small group. And so the next lesson, they would explore lunch and supper. And that's what it's usually called, you know, lunch and supper. If you're in a program that may serve dinner, if you're open more than 12 hours, you may be serving dinner. 
and, and the meal patterns are the same for lunch and dinner. And so they will explore those and the assignment would be to collect a weekly menu for these age groups one and two, and then three to five. This is where partnerships with child care centers come in. So um, I mentioned a number of times, it is also in the CDA handbook, you need to have an advisory committee because the advisory committee, it would be people like center directors, child care resource referral agencies. This will help you with um, gathering those materials. But it also supports that 480 hours of direct experience. And so lastly, the big assignments, this is how you're closing your particular lesson. And your lesson can last a week, two weeks. It just depends on how often your students come to you. So the final lesson, lesson five, would be menu planning. And so this would be a group assignment where they would develop a menu together. Now, this sounds simple, but I'm telling you, it was one of the hardest things for my students to do. But one, once they learned it, oh my gosh, the light bulbs, they just you know, started coming on and they understood the importance of a quality meal for young children and why the funding was so important uh, to have a healthy meal when they're in child care. So they do the group assignment together where they're developing a weekly menu, and that's, I did breakfast, lunch, and snack for five days. That's 15, basically, uh, meals, right? Or uh, 10 meals and five snacks. And then lastly, you have your unit test. You know, we test them uh, in our programs, which prepares them for the CDA exam, right? So their unit test is on nutrition and young children and child care. So again, that's one lesson. I just wanted to throw one out there to you because the great thing is, is under menu planning, once they have that quality menu, you can actually use that as a resource for your portfolio. Nothing that you're doing should be busy work. It all has a purpose. So let's dig into the portfolio. We should know that it's a professional portfolio. Where you are in Cyberverse, y'all say it with me. It's a professional portfolio. And so it should be legible, portable. Um, if, yes, it should be professional looking, manageable in size because they're going to have to carry this and they'll be putting things in it when they're doing their 480 hours of work experience. So um, it needs to be current. So it needs to be done within the last six months. And it must be written in the student's own words because it is a candidate driven process. Remember those CDA books I talked about? You're going to need one for each student. I often get the question about um, whether you need to buy the books. When they're in that last year with you, again, whether it's your uh, year two or year three, when they're in their last year of ECE in your high school CTE program, every student would need the book. They need the yellow book if they chose infant and toddler as their setting. They need the green book if they chose preschool as their setting. Every student needs a book. Why, Bisa? Because they're consumable. They're going to be tearing pages out of them. The council has been wonderful. So uh, the pages are perforated where they have to tear them. And I'll talk about those a little bit more in detail today. So in your budget, uh, right now the books are $25. Put the $25 per student in your budget for year three or year two, whichever one's your last year. So one of the first things that you will need for your portfolio is cover sheets. All right, cover sheets. Um, the cover sheet, let me start with what that is. And it says sheets for two reasons. In front of the portfolio, and, and we'll stop sharing in a, few, in a few minutes, not just yet, and I'll show you the cover in the front. But also inside of the portfolio, there's a cover sheet that is provided in the CDS standards guide from the council. And so again, I'll show you that in a little bit. So they'll need their portfolio cover sheet, They'll also need uh, the summary of their CDA education uh, worksheet, which is also in the book, and I'll show it to you in a minute. The family questionnaires, as well as the summary sheet, and the reflective dialogue sheet. So I'll go over those in a moment. Those are all perforated pages in your CDA standards book, which is, again, why each student needs their own book. So this is how those uh, pages look. Um, and again, we'll go over each of them individually. So uh, they have a summary of my city education, again, perforated pages. And this is where you tell the council, yes, I have earned all of my training, 120 hours of city of education in the eight subject areas that are required. And so they have to, you know, check off next to each one showing that they have earned those hours, 120 hours in those subject areas, and then sign and date it. So again, it can't be more than six months old. 
They also have family questionnaires. There's one, it's back in front in your CDA standards guide. It's in English and Spanish. Other languages are available if you contact the council, um, but they tear those out, make a copy of those, and they issue those to parents. And again, we'll talk a little bit more because I did see a question in the chat. After they collect their family questionnaires, we want this to be a reflective learning experience. So they have to actually re review the questionnaires they collected from the families, and they have to document what they learned from what the parents said about what they're doing with young children. And then lastly, you have the reflective dialogue worksheet. Uh, which is done during the verif during the CDA verification visit. That's that 50 minutes to an hour where the PD specialist is sitting with the student after they have uh, done their observation, their visit, letting them know, uh, helping them to set their goals, education goals, career goals. So next slide, we'll dig into each of them a little bit more. This is the cover sheet. Again, it's in your CDA standards book already. It's in all of the CDA standards books and they just tear it out. They tear out this uh, book, that this sheet, and it's the first page that you will see in your CDA portfolio. It's the very first page that you will see. And it's basically a way for you to check off everything. Uh, the student checks off everything that they have done. Your CDA portfolio is in, its, in this exact order. What'd you say, Bisa? Your CDA portfolio is in this exact order that's on your uh, cover sheet. So that's what's really important. And so you have students go through each one, A all the way through J. It's 10 different sections checking off the items that they have. Again, we're going to go over those today. Items A through C, those are the forms that you can find in your CDA standards book. Items A through C. And then once you get to D, uh, D gets into your resource collection, your competency standards and statements. And then J is your professional philosophy statement. So next slide. This is your summary of your CD education sheet. It's right behind your cover sheet in your standards book. So it's, again, they're right in order. So this is where they're going to initial next to each of the eight CDA subject areas to show that, yes, I have learned that information in my class and earned those 120 hours of education that are required. Your family questionnaire. So yes, you must um, give these out to the families. I saw a question in the chat about how hard it is to collect those. The ideal way to issue family questionnaires is your students should be working with a consistent classroom um, before they actually are completing your program. You want to make sure they are assigned to a classroom where they're getting consistent engagement with the same children and families. Okay, I want to say that again. Think of it as a practicum or internship um, type experience, apprenticeship type experience where they are working at least the last six months or so before they earn their, um, finish their, their program, they should be assigned to Ms. Johnson's class and stay in Ms. Johnson's class. So Ms. Johnson's students, Ms. Johnson's three-year-olds, they know the student, right? And so do the parents because the student may be there in the morning or in the afternoon to greet the families. So that's why the family questionnaires are so important in the CDA process. We want the family's engagement and their, and their, and their view of uh, working with the student. So those are given out to the families. They complete them. Uh, the student collects them or the teacher they're working with collects them. And the student has to sit down using the family questionnaire summary sheet that's in the standards book. And they have to review it and answer the questions. How many did you give out? How many did you get back? How many questionnaires did you get back? You know, what are some glows and grows basically is in turn, um, basically what it says on the form. Okay. So they can reflect on it. All right. And then the, uh, on the, in the summary of CD education, so again, these forms are in the book. These forms are in the book. This is how they look. And your questionnaires, they're in black and white. You can tear them out. Again, the pages are perforated. Uh, it's front and back. And you can, if you don't have the luxury of getting them copied at the school, again, partnership is important. So you work with your program, your child care program that you partner with for their practicum experience, and they can copy them for you oftentimes. So one, one way or the other, but you give them out to the, to the students in the class with the parents, you collect those, and then the student reflects on those questions um, that were answered by the parents. Yes. 
that's the form, yeah. And then the verification form, the reflective dialogue worksheet, again, that is not done. Um, the only part that is done, let me correct that. The only part that is done is under, uh, is items 1A and B. So before the visit, the students need to go ahead and reflect on their family questionnaires, which again, they're using this summary sheet here. They're identifying their areas of strength, their areas of product um, um, professional growth, and they're writing their responses under 1A and B on this reflective dialogue sheet that again is in your standards book. When they have their verification visit, the last thing that happens is the reflective dialogue that lasts about 50 minutes to an hour. And again, they're sitting there with their PD specialist discussing uh, their areas for future growth. And the one A and B are already completed. They're talking with their PD specialist to complete two C and D and then three E and F together, okay? All right, what about the resource collection? I know many of you guys came to learn about the resource collection, so let's dig into it. These are the resources in a nutshell that must be collected in the portfolio, whether you do it in print or online. I mentioned to you earlier that items A through C would be the forms uh, that uh, are in on the checklist. Items A through C, summary of my CD education, uh, family questionnaire summary sheet, that is what's A through C. Okay, that's important. But when you get through D through I on D through I on your cover sheet, because it's A through J, it's 10 different sections on your CDA cover sheet that goes in your portfolio, resources for your portfolio. Items D through I on the cover sheet, these are the resources. Okay, these are the resources. So they're supposed to collect and organize these resources uh, that reflect the CDA standards. So RC1, resource collection, that's what RC stands for, resource collection one, they have to have a first aid and CPR card. And it's very important that they have pediatric or uh, infant toddler on that card because they need to know infant child uh, CPR, uh, pediatric CPR. And based on who you get your training from, they may use the word pediatric or they may use the word infant toddler, infant child. So either one of those is fine, but that's required to earn their, um, their CDA. I used to implement that. I had three years when I was teaching high school CTE. I had EC1 that was a whole year, EC2 a whole year, EC3 a whole year in Georgia. Uh, so in Georgia, we have three years of ECE to complete the full pathway. So in year two, I implemented first aid, we did first aid CPR training. It was a unit, a uh, health and wellness unit in our curriculum. And uh, I actually got trained as an instructor and through Project SAVE, which is through uh, Children's Health Care of Atlanta, it was a, a grant funded project, got trained and I was able to provide that. But I'd like to recommend that you may partner with your PE program, your physical education program, or you may uh, partner if you have a health uh, healthcare program in your CTE high school program, then that's a great fit as well. But if you can't do the training yourself, reach out to your child care resource and referral agency. Again, your Advisory committee is very important here because there are plenty of ways that you can get this training done for your students. It's a unit, they get a grade for it, and they get their first aid CPR card. It goes in their portfolio behind RC1, uh, which would be tab D. Uh, they also have to have a weekly menu. The council does not say that the student has to develop the menu. They can collect the menu from the child care center that you partner with for them to earn their 480 hours. I, as an instructor, though, just used to like for them to learn the process of planning a menu. So I didn't mind if they used the, the correct one that they developed or the one from the site. They just had to have a weekly menu for the age group uh, and setting that they chose infant, toddler, or preschool. They also need a weekly plan, a weekly lesson plan. And again, they can collect this or they can develop it themselves, but it needs to be developmentally appropriate. And in your standards book, the council outlines what it wants to see. Uh, the goals for the child, the activities, the procedures, the materials that are needed to do the activities, um, all of that's in there as well. But uh, they have to have a weekly lesson plan. Again, doesn't matter if they develop, develop it or collect it from the site. So that is RC1. Those are resources that go behind tab D. Uh, tab, the next tab, E, is RC2. They have to, to create nine stimulating uh, learning activities. And based on the age group, they're going to have uh, certain topics that they have to cover, maybe self-awareness, self-concept, self-esteem, uh, science, 
um, language literacy, but the council outlines in the standards books which activities they need for the nine and the age groups that they should be developed for. And again, they tell you what they want on those particular um, for each of the learning activities. Just follow instructions. It's all about looking at the guide, seeing what they want, and you as an instructor make that a part of your curriculum. And uh, it can be a grade because we know they'll do it if it's a grade, right? The students will complete it. Make sure you have that outline in your um, guide for uh, your assignment. So there's nine similar activities. RC3, which would be tab F, uh, they have a bibliography of 10 children's books. And because this is the social emotional standard, the children's books need to be based on challenges children may have. Again, it can be on, um, I, I love When Dinosaurs Divorce was a book that's one of my faves I mention a lot because a dinosaur is divorced and not the parents. Um, tell me again about the night I was born. I love that one. I mentioned that one a lot because it's about adoption. So think about books that can support a new baby being born, because we know sometimes that children may have a difficult time when mom has a new baby. They may feel like they're not, you know, um, they're neglected a little bit because the baby's getting all the attention. So 10 books that relate to social emotional development. Here's a way I'm going to give you guys this idea. Something I used to love to do is every Monday in my program was skinny day. So we were on a, uh, on a block schedule. And we had eight classes, uh, six classes. And so on skinny day, we saw every all, all classes for 50 minutes. And then on Monday and Wednesday, we only saw, you know, one set of classes. And then on um, the next other days, we saw a different set of classes. But on skinny day, I read a children's book every single Monday. And at first, they looked at me like, is this lady really going to read us a children's book? <laughs> and then it got to the point where... Let me try to skip it. Are we? They love the children's books. And it got to the point where the, I had them read them and they would fight over who was going to read. I want to read. I want to read. So make sure you're implementing that in your curriculum. So it really, I introduced a new children's book to them every year, every year. Um, and so again, an idea. And that would make it easier for, you, for them to start collecting their bibliography for 10 books. They don't have to have the books in their portfolio. They just have to... Uh, have the title, the author, and again, the council tells you a summary of what the book is about. They tell you in the standards book. So that's RC3. And then uh, RC4 is a resource, a family resource guide. Part of being a, a, a national CDA and a credential early education professional is you need to know how to help families. And so you have to know where to send a family if they have a child with special needs, what resources are in your community, what if they speak a different language. So the council asks you for RC4 to develop, develop a resource guide, and it's about four different resources they have to collect to support families. That's RC4, and again, you can make this a part of your unit that applies to uh, family engagement. Uh, RC5 is re record keeping forms. So they have to collect like an anecdotal record, assessment form, an emergency form. They have to collect three forms uh, as a part of RC5, which um, would support them in program management on the program management standard. Again, making an assignment. You can also have them research it together, do groups, make it fun. Don't just make it uh, robotic about completing the portfolio. And then lastly is resource collection six, RC6. Uh, they have three things to do there. What are their state regulations for childcare, uh, early childhood association? Someone asked in the Q&A early on, do they have to be a member? You do not have to join an early child association to earn your CDA. You just have to to know about them and put that information in your portfolio. So do you know about NEYC or NBCDI? What are some of the associations you know about? And they have to have that information of their portfolio to show awareness. But when they renew their CDA in three years, then yes, they will have had to join at least one national association that has a local affiliate. And so finally, is child abuse and neglect. Um, what are the legal requirements for child abuse and neglect in your program? And so they'll need to know that information because as early educators, guys, we are mandated reporters for child abuse. You can go to jail if a child was abused and they were in your class and you didn't report it. And we do not want to be the poster child for not reporting child abuse. Uh, and I want to go back up to uh, say here on the state, uh, state regulations on the RC6 as well. 
Another part of state regulations, the council wants you to know, wants the students to know what's required to apply for a director's position, a teacher position, assistant position. They want to know the students to know from the state level what uh, opportunities they have in the field. Uh, all ECE instructors, actually all CT around the nation, employability is one of the first standards, employability skills. So this goes under your employability skills unit. Let's look at the statements of competence, the reflective statements of competence. This will also uh, be a part of the same section uh, of your portfolio as the resources. So there are uh, six competency goals and function areas uh, for the CDA. I mentioned eight because there are eight subject areas, but if you're teaching these six goals with the 13 functional areas, you're gonna cover those eight subject areas that I talked about. Uh, the great thing about using the council's materials is that in the essentials book, there are six units, the six goals, and there are 13 chapters, 13 functional areas. Unit one, goal one, it has three chapters. Unit two is goal two, it has four chapters. Y'all feeling me out there? The council has organized all of the content for your curriculum. All you gotta do is grab a hold of it and implement it. We're not asking you to do anything new or extra. We're just asking you to align what you're currently doing with what is going to count for the NASH credential. Okay, can I, can I repeat that? We're not asking you to do anything that's new or extra because we know teachers were already busy and work hard. Make sure your curriculum is organized and aligned around the credential that will allow them to go to work. All right. So just wanted to remind you of those six standards and the 13 functional areas, which cover help you cover everything uh, in your program. So reflective statements of competence, uh, these are, uh, this is the literacy part of your curriculum, where you will write, uh, the students will write a statement for each of those goals that we just showed you. So they will have a statement for goal one, health, safety, and learning environment, and what they do with young children to implement safe, a safe, healthy learning environment. They will have goal two, uh, what do they do to implement physical uh, development, um, com com uh, communication. So all of the different goals goals, for every goal, uh, they will write a reflective statement based on their 480 hours, their experiences working with young children. What do I do in the classroom to implement each of the statements, uh, each of the standards? So that is what the competency statements are. Um, it reflects their philosophy, and it's no more than 500 words per statement. So I know sometimes instructors will have the students writing an essay, it's not an essay, it's a statement. But here's the thing, we know in CTE, they're really pushing us to implement more uh, literacy. So here's the thing, you can actually start out with an essay because one of the other um, things they want us to do is to make sure that we're showing children, students how to shrink information because people are only gonna read so much. So you can start out with an essay if you like as a part of your, your uh, assignments, but you want to ask them to make it short, make it abstract, uh, a statement, turn that two-page essay into just one simple statement, and that part will go in their portfolio. So it's giving you some tips on your curriculum. And again, this is also D through I, so it goes right along with your company statement. So you'll have an RC1, a resource one, resource collection one, and you will also have a CS1, a company standard one. So you have a resource and a statement all behind tabs D through I. And again, it's on your CDA cover sheet. So this is an example of how these look. I don't want to read to you, but these will be in the follow-up email because you guys will have these, um, this whole slideshow. So in the slideshow, we wanted to make sure we include an example of what they look like. In the actual standards guide, this is where the statement comes from. It, this is what they ask you to do. Okay, so it will say for CS3, which is social emotional development and positive guidance, um, you can either, and this is the way I like to do it too, to make it simple. They can write a statement um, for each of the functional areas in that particular uh, section, uh, company statement, or they can do a whole just general uh, paragraph on just the goal. So it's up to you if you want just a statement to be on the goal 
the, of the six goals. But I, you know, oftentimes to, to, to make sure they cover all of the areas, you can make sure all of those components, those functional areas that they cover all of those in that statement, okay? That they cover all of those in that statement. Because each competency goal has a different number of functional areas. So all of the functional areas need to be covered in your competency statement. The instructions are there in your book. And again, that's your literacy assignments that you, you will implement for each of the standards. So, yep, your um, complete your reflective statement. And again, it can be a paragraph about the teaching practices that you implement. Again, this is where they tell you that you can write one paragraph for functional area. That's the route that I went because I wanted to make sure the students covered everything. So for instance, for competence standard one, which is self, uh, um, safe, healthy learning environment, instead of having them write one statement on safe, healthy learning environment, I wanted to make sure it was all covered. So I, I had them write a paragraph on safe, what do you do to ensure safety in the classroom with infants and toddlers based on the age group they chose? So they had one on safe, and then they had a paragraph on healthy, which encompasses your nutrition, uh, wellness, um, hand washing, first aid, CPR, all that's covered under healthy. And then you have the third one, which is learning environment. That's where your activities and your lesson plans come in. So they had a, I had them do a statement for each one. So you can do a statement that encompasses all three in one statement for the goal, or you can do a paragraph for each of the function areas. The choice is yours and the reminder is here. And again, this comes directly from the guide. But remember this, you're not done once you write those statements because there are additional paragraph, the additional items that council will add Ask you again in the standards book. So you see CS3A and CS3B, they also need to respond to those. Okay. So after you've done your competency statements on the actual standards, it's important on the goals and functional areas, it's important to make sure you're answering uh, the next section. And sometimes it's three questions, sometimes it's one, but make sure you're following those um, additional items. Next slide, please. We wanted to provide you an example of an actual company statement. Again, I want to read it to you, but it would be in your follow-up email. So this is for CS3, again, Social Emotional Development Positive Guidance, and the student simply uh, writes this statement. And this does satisfy that first part um, before you get to CS3 A and B, those additional questions. Or again, you can have them to write a statement for each one, one on self, one on, you know, one, one on positive guidance, one paragraph for each of the function areas. The choice is yours. Um, all right, next slide. So let's dig into what many of you guys came here for um, as well. After we talk about philosophy statement, we're going to dig into how to organize a portfolio. So the last part of your CDA um, portfolio is the philosophy statement, the professional philosophy statement. This is item J. That's the last one. There are 10 sections. So item J on your portfolio cover sheet. And this is where the student, the candidate uh, discusses their professional beliefs and their values about early childhood education. So it's again, their final task is no more than two pages. And so, you know, you can make this a final exam if you want. Sometimes we have a project exam and actual test. You know, you can make it part of, you know, a really important grade for that final year if you like. The choice is yours, of course. And again, this was no more than four, 500 words per, um, that's for the statements, but no more than two pages is really important for this particular one. Again, the last part of your portfolio, it is item J. All right, how do you organize this thing? Huh, what do we do? So today we're gonna to talk about how to organize the printed portfolio as well as how you can do it online. You don't have to do both. You only have to do one. They can choose to do the printed one or the one online. So let's discuss some tips. I'm checking my time here. This is something I really want you all to remember because I know we're trying to teach a whole curriculum and we may have them for a whole two years or three years. You need to understand that the only items that go in the portfolio in the city of professional portfolio are the items that are requested on the cover sheet in this book. So that again, Bisa, only the items that are in here. It is not a scrapbook, all right? So not a bunch of pictures of working with children, only the items that are in the book. That's what's required. So this is an example of how a printed portfolio may look like, may, may look if you choose to go this route. 
All you need is maybe a, a 1.5 inch three ring binder. Uh, you can get those in bulk if you need to for your students. You need sheet protectors. I usually say budget for 25 per student. If you get budget for 25 uh, sheet protectors per student, those are the clear, um, the clear protectors where the papers can slide into to keep it neat and strong and not tear it up because they're going to be carrying it around a lot. Um, budget for 25 per student, you should be good to go. And then the extra wide uh, dividers and big tabs, because once you put it in the portfolio, um, the sheet protectors, the tabs will be hidden behind the sheet protectors if you don't have the big tabs and the extra wide dividers. So uh, those are what I recommend, and I will show you those in a moment. So here are some items. We're not promoting any particular um, product or brand, but you may want to use, uh, this is an example of the tabs. You can have the ones they can type on, which sometimes may be harder for students, but they also have the ones that you can write on with a Sharpie or something to, to make it neat. Okay, so they have the tabs that you can pull off. And then our printed portfolio, you're going to go to your cover sheet, all right? So let me go deep here and um, move along. So your portfolio cover sheets, items A through J, is 10 sections, item A through J. So you want to make sure you have a uh, 10 tabs. They need, they're going to need 10 tabs. And you're going to organize your tabs. Only thing that's going to be written on your tabs are A through J. 10 tabs, one letter on each of those tabs. That's it. And those tabs correspond with the cover sheet. Next slide. All right, so we're going to stop sharing the screen for a moment. I'm going to show you really quickly how to organize your CDA printed portfolio, and then we're going to dig into your online one. All right, so this is, I like the one with the clear cover. The clear view is what it's called, because the clear view allows you to slide in your little sheet. And this can have visas. Portfolio, Visa CDA Professional Portfolio can be on here, right? This is an uh, inch and a half binder. And look how my tabs stick out. And they will have A through J. These tabs will have A through J on them. Imagine half 10, okay? And then your sheet protectors are inside. Your first page is your professional portfolio cover sheet. Again, you're going to have a color one from the actual standards guide, but this is your CDA Professional Portfolio cover sheet. It's the first thing you see. And everything else, A through J, is going to align with it. So when I go to tab A, what's back there? Summary of my CD education. Tab B, family questionnaire summary sheet. Tab C, it continues to go along with the cover sheet. That is the printed portfolio. Just follow the instructions on the cover sheet. Uh, lastly, I'll say the resources and the uh, company statements go behind the same tab. So if you look at D, your company statements will go first, and then your resources will go behind your company statements. For E, it's, then, it's the next one, okay? So just continue to follow along uh, with the actual cover sheet, and that is your printed portfolio. Please put your questions in the chat. We're going to move on to the online portfolio, and then we're going to get ready to wrap up for some Q&A. Uh, so for your online professional portfolio, I recommend using Google Drive. Why, Visa? It's free. It's free. But of course, you know, here's the thing. If you use your school account, when a student graduate, oftentimes they no longer have access to that. And, and they may have graduated before they actually have that visit and look at all the information they have lost. So I recommend using their uh, Google Drive, their personal Google account, so that they can carry this with them after they have graduated. Uh, and then again, it needs to be done within six months before they have their visit. Just like I showed you on the printed portfolio, same for the online portfolio. You're going to have 10 Google folders. What are the folders going to say? A, B, 10 folders. Next slide. So we're going to explore um, Google Drive right quick. I have, I have Caleb Thompson here with me who is going to show you. He's phenomenal. He will show you how to set up the Google folders, the main folder, the subfolders. He'll also show you how to upload and drop files into the folders and then how you can share your Google Drive with your PD specialist and your instructor. All right, Caleb. A little roll please for you. Yes, hi, Caleb. Hi, how are you? Hello, everybody. My name is Caleb Thompson, and today I will be showing you how to navigate your professional portfolio and how to create it from scratch when you use your personal Google Drive account. So as you can see, 
up here, this is how it might look when you are completed with the process. Um, I just wanted to go through these categories right here. You see suggested folders and files. So this suggested up top is going to show any recent files that may have been uploaded, any files that may have been shared with you over the past week, past month, whatever time frame. So the suggested is more so just going to show you the recent activity of what's been going on in your drive. The main thing that you guys want to be focusing on is what we have right here, which says CDAPP folder. I'm going to click on that. And you can see in here, it says folders. Uh, this says J through A. Sometimes what Google Drive does is it will have your folders in descending order. In order to change that, you can just click this and reverse the sort direction, and you will now see it from folders A through J. And when you're creating your own, if you just have the letter, there's a good chance that it will just automatically be in alphabetical order. And then if we go in these folders, we can see that there are just a few files in there, and those files are within those subfolders. So then underneath this folders category, you can see we have these the files category. So this is in your main directory. So all of these files down here are in your main directory. So if anybody shares something with you on Google Drive, or if you just upload something to Google Drive, this is where it will show up, but it's not in a particular folder. So to show you how to do that from scratch, when you get to your Google Drive homepage, this is what you'll be presented with, and this will be your main home directory. You'll see this over here, this new button. If you click on that, anything that you decide to create in here, you can see we have new folder. This is to upload, and then you can see we have Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, Forms, etc. These will all create new documents or folders within your main uh, home directory. So that's what we want to do. We're going to go ahead and click this and we're just going to call it CDA PP folder two. And you can see it shows up under the folders tab. Now this is going to be your main folder. Once you click on this, you're going to come in here and now you are in your PP folder directory. So anything that you click on now from this new tab will show up within this main folder. It won't show up in your home directory. So you can either click on this new tab and click new folder, and we can just do A. And you'll see that this shows up in the folders section of your main folder. So this is a subfolder A. Additionally, you can also right click. If you right click within the folder, you'll see that same thing pops up. You can create a new folder, call it B, et cetera, et cetera. So that is how you create your main folders and your subfolders. And that will all appear in here. To get to your main directory, you always just want to click My Drive. And that will bring you to this home page right here. Now, let's show you how to upload and drop files into those folders. So as I said before, you have your three categories, your suggested, your folders, and your files. And you can see we just have some loose files here. We have a high school fact sheet. We have a mock progress report. We have a music file. And with these different things, let's say you want to find them their proper space. Now, if we wanted to move this fact sheet into folder A, we would click on it and hold, and you can see now we can move it around, and I would hover over the folder that I want to place it in, and it will automatically move to that folder. Now, when I click in here, you can see once again, you have the folders category and the files category, and we can go ahead and drag that into folder A. And now we can see that it is within folder A. That's one way to do it. A much easier way that might be better for you once you start having multiple files and multiple things that you have to move within different folders. Once again, you can click, right click on the file. And you can see this right here where it says move to. You can click on that and it will bring up your directory in more of a streamlined manner. So you can see we have the home directory, my drive. Then you can go to your main folder, which says CDAPP folder. You can click on that. 
then you can click on, let's put it in folder B this time. We can click on folder B and then we can click move and we can move that. Now it has been moved to folder B. If I go on there, we will see that it's now in folder B. So you can do this either by dragging or you can right click and you can use the move to function and that will show you how to do it which might be easier for you once you get further along in the process of your portfolio. So that is how you move files into a main folder or a subfolder. Now let's see how to upload files. If you wanted to upload files, what you could do is either you could click new right here and you'll see file upload or folder upload. And if we click file upload, it will bring up your main directory and we can double click that. And we can see on the right side, it's been uploaded. And now we can see that that showed up in our files directory. And this is going to happen where whichever location you are in your directory is where that file is going to upload. So now that we are in our main folder, if we wanted to upload another file, we could click file upload once again, it will bring that up. If I decide to put in this other file, we can see that it uploads directly into the main CDAPP folder. Additionally, if you wanted to upload something directly into your subfolder, you could either right click and then you'll see this file upload or you could go over to this new tab and you'll see the file upload. That is how you upload files into either your main home directory, your main folder, whichever one of your subfolders that you might need to, and they'll find their respective place based on where you want them. And the final thing, which is very important on knowing the nuances of, is sharing your Google Drive, either files or folders with other people. So let's say, for example, you wanted to share a lesson or you wanted to share this fact sheet with somebody, you could click right click on this file and you see how this share pops up. You would click on share. And when you click on share, you can see people with access. This is us right here. This is the example. So this is the only person who has access at the moment. When you see general access, you have some options, restricted or anyone with link, you should keep it at restricted so that only people with access can open the link. If you were to change it to anyone with link, anybody who had the link could access that. And that is not what you would want. So let's say we go ahead and put in an email in there. Once you put in that email, you can put in multiple emails and you can decide whether you want them to edit. If you click editor, that means that they will have the ability to edit whatever file it is that you're sharing with them. So if you have an assignment or if you have a Word document or anything that you want them to be able to put their input on or you want them to be able to edit, you would keep it at editor. If you only wanted them to be able to view the file, for example, this is a PDF file, we wouldn't want anyone being able to edit it only to read it. We would click on viewer and that means that they would only be able to view the file. They would not be able to make any changes. Now, the main thing is you want to always make sure that notify people is checked. That means that they will get an email letting them know that you have shared a file with them. And you can also include a message if you would like. You can say something like, this is your fact sheet. And when you click send, it will send them an email letting them know that that has been shared with them along with the message that you sent. Now that's how you do it for a specific file. It is the same concept with a folder. Let's say you wanted to share one of your subfolders with somebody. You would click on the folder. You would right click on the folder and then you can see share once again. It would be the same process. You could put that in there. You could choose whether you wanted them to be a viewer or an editor. And you can see down under here, if you're sharing a folder with somebody and you make them an editor, it gives them the ability to organize, add, and edit files within that folder. So 
make sure that you know whether you want that person to be able to edit or only view whatever it is that you're sharing with them. That's very important. So for example, let's say we just want this person to be able to view this folder. We don't want them messing around with any of the contents of our folder. So we can say this and we can put in a message. Can you check my folder for me? And then you would click send. It would send them an email along with that message. And then you can see how that little person started to show up uh, on that folder icon. That now is showing that they have access. And you can see that up here, that it's shared. And if I click on that, it will show all of the people with access. And with that, you can also remove access from people that you share these folders and these files with. And to do that within the folder, you would just click on that uh, people icon, then you would go down to where you allowed them to be a viewer or an editor, and you would click remove access. And now you can see that they are no longer have access to this folder, and they would not be able to view it any longer. Same concept with a Word document, a PDF, an Excel sheet, it would all be the same thing. Just to demonstrate that for a little bit, I'll go into a mock progress report with this Excel sheet. We would go ahead and we would click on share. If you wanted to do it within the file, there would you would have a share button right there. Then once again, same process, put in the name of who you want it to be. We'll make them an editor this time, and then we'll say, can you review this progress report? And you don't have to put the message. If you want to say something to them, if there are any instructions, then you can put that. It's not required, but I always recommend that you put notify people that that make sure that is checked so that way they are getting an email to let them know that you have shared something with them and it doesn't just slip by them. And you would do that. And it would be shared with them as well. And that is how you would navigate your professional portfolio on Google Drive. This is how you would organize your main folders and your subfolders, upload and drop files along with sharing with others. Thank you, Kelly. Before you stop sharing your screen, you're amazing. Uh, and I want to thank all of the uh, viewers uh, who are who already know how to do this. And uh, thank you for sitting here with us because everyone doesn't. And, and sometimes people's uh, portfolio items can get deleted because they did make someone an editor. But this makes it easy for you to implement the program. Um, before Caleb uh, stops sharing the screen, I want to uh, the show, the transfer ownership is important because it is the month of February right now. If you have students who are graduating in May and they have not had their visit, it's going to, and, and their portfolio is on their, their email for the school system, it's going to be important for them to transfer ownership to their personal Gmail so that they can, um, it can be viewed when they graduate. So if you'll show transfer ownership and then we'll move on. Of course. So going back to that, let's say that we shared this folder and now this person has access to this folder what we would do is we would go in here we would click on that shared icon and we would click on transfer ownership and then once what we can see right here that this person hasn't accepted their ownership so right now we'll be the owner of it but we can send this invitation and this would send our ownership of this folder to the person that we are sharing it to. So like Dr. Bisa said, if you have them on a student email or an account where they will not have access to it in the near future, you can share that folder, that drive, you can share whatever it is that you need to share with a personal email. And once you share it with that personal email, you can then transfer ownership to that personal email and accept that invitation. And then that would mitigate or that would eliminate the possibility of it getting lost once they graduate. 
Thank you so much, Caleb. You guys give them a virtual hand clap. Uh, wanted you guys to have that so you can replay it and replay it and replay it when you get the recording. And also, this is something you can have the students work on in groups. I promise you, when it comes to technology, sometimes it's smarter than us. Uh, so they haven't been born in, in a time when there wasn't technology. So um, you can have groups where they can actually teach each other how to do that. So um, as we do with young children as well. So thank you again, Caleb. You guys, again, can replay this over and over. Next slide. So applying for city assessment, I want to just review some things. I've said a lot of this during the presentation because I really want to get to your questions. We have a lot of questions, um, uh, so I want to make sure we get to that. So the verification visit is, again, uh, after you, the council has said, yes, we accept your application, it is approved, uh, you can now have your verification visit and take your exam. So um, during the four hours, I mentioned the four hours of the verification visit, a professional development specialist, this is someone who has been approved to come out and uh, visit you. Again, you can go on the council website and you can, um, put, in your, you can uh, put in your zip code and find a specialist in your area, just like you can at Pearson View site for the exam. During that time, they're going to implement the, the ROR process, review, observe, and reflect. And again, uh, as you replay the video, it talks about the, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but they have one hour to review the portfolio. Portfolio. They're doing that on their own, just the PD specialist and your portfolio, not you. All right. They're going to observe you for two hours, a candidate working with young children. And then they'll pull the candidate in for the reflective dialogue um, to do the reflective dialogue sheet that's in your book. The PD specialist has 48 hours to send the scores to the council. Uh, and the cool thing is they give you the test, y'all. It's in the back of this book. The CSI, the Comprehensive Scoring Instrument that they complete, it's already in the book. So they have to bring this book to their visit. Another reason why you need one for each student. You go to a Pearson View site. Again, you can find it on the council's website uh, to schedule an exam once their, their uh, application has been approved. And then they sit there and they take 65, they do 65 multiple choice questions and um, and that's the exam. And so once the exam scores are in to the council, they go directly to the council. The scores are in from the PD specialist to the council. The council makes the final decision. Here we go. Multiple sources of evidence. You have the visit. You have the portfolio. You have the competence statements. You have the CSI scoring issue. You have all these items that go together to show that the student is competent. And they earn this credential. They're worth having, uh, their skills are worth having this credential. They get their scores. And then this council um, makes a decision based on all of this together. The PD specialist did not make the decision. PD specialists don't even know if a person is has uh, re, ha, is becoming a CDA and passed everything until that student tells them because all that goes to the student from the council. No one makes that decision but the council based on the multiple sources of evidence they received, including the CDA exam score. Here's some tips for success, and I'm going to turn it over to Michelle uh, Brown at the council for Q&A. So just remember, they need 120 hours of education. They're already getting that in your classroom. Just make sure you're covering all the competency goals and the functional areas. Make sure you find a partner, get your, your advisory committee together so they can earn those 480 hours working with young children while they're in high school. Make sure you have your competency standards book. Again, they can apply, on, apply online, which I highly recommend. Um, a Pearson Views Testing Center. Sometimes there are colleges near you, but again, putting your zip code on the council's website uh, on that particular section, they will help you find a Pearson View site and make sure your email, you have an active email, which is again, goes back to, um, you may have to utilize a personal email of the student if they are a senior and they're graduating before their visit. Uh, just some other helpful reminders to portfolio. The portfolio, they, they need to bring their portfolio and their CDA standards book to the verification visit because these are part of their score. It's part of the ROR process, as I mentioned. Um, also making sure that everything is done in the candidate's own words, it's not plagiarized, um, and that uh, Everything that they have done is just written appropriately based on their reflections of their time working with young children. It's the student's work. Of course, you can guide based on the experiences you're providing your curriculum, but it's their particular words and their work. It's a candidate-driven process. Nothing should be more than six months old. If you have a visit, a verification visit, and the family questionnaires are six months old, guess what? No credit there. Okay, make sure the first aid CPR card is valid, 
as well. You know, it has two, um, one or two years based on, you know, where you are for first aid CPR cards to expire. Make sure they have the portfolio and that it is current so that they can um, earn their CDA. We want everyone to be successful. We have a lot of resources. Uh, the council has a lot of resources for you. So let's look at those. We do know that we have the high school CDA handbook. So the link is in the chat. It will also be in your email. This is the printed version. We print, print them sometimes for conferences, but uh, you want the, the electronic version because we put links in there, the live links in this book for you to click on for additional resources. So make sure you download it. How much does it cost? It's free. Thank you, Council. You can have 30 minutes with me on TA Tuesday and we can discuss your questions and answers. So we don't get to your questions today, it's okay. There's a form on that same link uh, that's in the chat. All the high school uh, information's on that page and you can schedule a TA Tuesday with me. Bring everybody you need to that meeting so that we can uh, answer your questions, okay? So I want to turn it over to Michelle Brown, who's the Vice President of Policy and External Initiatives at the Council for Professional Recognition. Uh, Michelle, come on in and let's answer some questions and offer closing remarks and reminders. Thank you guys for listening today. I know it was a lot, but you're going to have the video to replay it. Bisa, oh my goodness. So first I want to say hello, Council community. I was glad, I'm glad to see you all this afternoon, and I love you all's commitment. You all keep showing up and showing out, and I mean a good way, um, regarding this question and answer session, but we're going to get to that in a second. First, I would like to thank Dr. Bisa, Caleb, and the council team for all this great information. Dr. Bisa, I thought I knew everything um, from being experienced with the CDA portfolio, but I promise you, I learned at least three or four new things. So I'm going to go off script, y'all, for a minute. You guys know how I do, okay? And so I don't want you to use the reaction, but in, in the spirit of being early childhood professionals, you know how we are. We're creative. I need you to celebrate our presenters, right? If you learned at least one thing new today, you know, do a heart at home, do some kind of celebration in your chair, right? I just want you to find a way to thank them because I felt like they found a way to stick a lot of information in such a little bit of time that I think um, was very useful to us to ensure that we provide a high quality CTE, CDA experience, right, for our scholars. So I'm just going to pause for 10 seconds to allow you to do that, okay? And I'm over here celebrating. Thank you, Dr. Visa. And a lot of what Dr. Visa shared, you're going to be able to find in the CDA High School Handbook. And like she said, you can come and fill out on the website, fill out the TA form. And then you can always get a hold of Sandy Kay, who is our high school CTE lead. We're going to get those questions answered. Now, I have to say this one more time. True to form, y'all. Y'all were very cerebral and you asked a lot of questions. But you do need to know that I've got to prioritize these questions based on what we talked about first. So the portfolio questions, the questions related to today's topic, I'm going to get to first. So... Dr. Bisa, you're off camera and ready, right? Sandy, come on, come on on to camera. And Caleb, I know you're not necessarily prepared to come on camera, but there may be some portfolio questions and some Google questions that you might have to answer. And you all, I just need to embarrass Caleb for a second, just in the spirit of early childhood. Chris is coming on too, in the spirit of early childhood education. Caleb is grown now, but I've known him since he was four. And just to see the way he handled that situation, how he's organized this whole webinar in the spirit of Black History Month and Black History being 365, he's making me feel Black boy joy. So Caleb, hats off to you for such a wonderful Google Drive, uh, Google CDA online portfolio presentation. Okay, y'all, let's get to these questions, okay? Okay. So here's the first question, and it's about the Google Drive. Is the Google Drive free for folks to use to build the online portfolios? Yes, it is. And here's the thing. Google is so wonderful. It's free to Google. Google Drive is free for educators. Google Classroom is free for educators as well. So it is free. All right. That's great. OK, here's another good question related to the portfolio. If students slash instructors do not want torn pages, 
in their portfolio, you know, from the perforated pages in the book, are there forms and cover sheets online uh, um, that they can print off? No, they're not online. They have to actually buy the uh, the actual uh, book, the standards guide. And again, they're perforated. You can cut them out if you want. That's why I recommend the sheet protectors. Even the cover sheet, the CDA cover sheet, should go in a sheet protector. And this, the sheet protector is plastic and it keeps anything from tearing. Great. Okay, I have another question that may be technical. It says, is the online portfolio available version available only for high school candidates? Anyone can complete a uh, an online portfolio, anyone. So remember the process, the whole CDA process is, is, is not just for high school, it's the same for everyone. So anyone can do it online, online or printed, the choice is theirs. Great, now I'm gonna read this question then and I may need the technical folks to come in and help us to answer this. So somebody put in the chat, so by this you mean that the digital portfolio must be created in Google Drive instead of having the whole portfolio compiled in a single document, then each tab should have a file with the resource collections needed for each. If you want to do it that way, you can, but the way Caleb showed you is it's much less complicated having the 10 folders, A through J. It's easier to understand because all of the items go along with A through J. But if you want to have subfolders within A through J and do one subfold for RC1 within, a, you know, you can do that if you'd like, uh, but we want to show you a simple way to do it all. Okay, great. Um, here's another one. What does a student need to show if she took a year of classes for ECE at a career technical center and then um, took dual credit um, in another early childhood class on curriculum? Do you have to include her high school transcript showing her classes in the portfolio? Um, if she has, they, they're either gonna have a high school transcript if they or if they're dual enrolled, they may have a transcript from the high school and a transcript from the college. They may have both. The only thing that wouldn't be the same here is a, a certificate. If they took a training, maybe you partner with a CCRNR, Child Care Resource and Referral Agency, and they provided CDA training for your high schoolers or something, and they have a certificate with 120 hours, that could suffice. But for high school CTE, this is not community based training, it's different. They're going to need a transcript from the high school and or the college if it's dual, enro dual enrollment. All right, great, Dr. Bisa. Here's another question that's important, but fun. I think we might have a designer here or a fashionista. I love the electronic folder idea. Is there a way to jazz it up, jazz it up such as an Im image photo to the main CDA PP folder, you know, to make it look a little less bland yet professional lol yeah and actually what i tell my told my students is this cover whether it's virtual um printed online this is your create this is your place to be creative so if you want to jazz up and say michelle's brown city of professional portfolio and you have your, your big pretty hair you can do that there but it is a professional portfolio it's okay if you do it, but it's not going to count for anything. So that's what I want to just stress there. I will put that energy in the cover. But after that, hey, it's all about the professional content uh, that is answering those questions and gathering those resources that are required. Okay, great. So there's some questions. I'm going to go to some questions that are, are related, right? Um, so this question is, do any of the CDA resources, essentials, or consumables have exemplary reflective statements of competence that student can use to build their portfolio. They're getting ahead of us, Michelle, aren't they? <laughs> right, right. We have a new resource that's coming out. Michelle will tell you about it in a little bit. But in the meantime, if you utilize this slideshow that's going to be in your follow-up email, there's a sample there. But it really is a statement, guys, based on what do I do it's written in, 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 in first tense. What do I do in the classroom with young children? And it's based on e each functional area. If students have a paragraph on each of the 13 functional areas, you just tell them what folder to slide it in, <laughs> but just make sure they answer those other questions too uh, in the standards guide for each of the comments and statements. All right, thank you, Dr. Visa. How about this question? 
Are there sample unit assessments that Dr. Visa referenced available with the curriculum? I, I honestly try to make sure that um, the assessments are industry based, but honestly, for instance, in your first year, and, and someone asked this question, I'm going to jump to this too and answer this together, Michelle. Okay. Saw a lot of questions about the previous webinars I mentioned, uh -huh. if you go to the council's YouTube channel, as well as on the high school CDA page, the link that was in the chat, uh, you know, being your follow-up email, all of the previous webinars are there, they're on YouTube and they're on the link in the chat uh, on the CDA page. Uh, so so a couple are on that page and, and the rest are on, on YouTube. So um, in one of those videos, when we talked about the curriculum. I actually shared a little information um, about this, Michelle, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, you can, and, and remind me again, their specific question. I want to make sure I answer it all. About sample um, curriculum units. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So in the... Uh, and I talk about it on the webinars, but also there is a guide here in the handbook on how to create your units. So you can utilize that. And then we have an implementation guide that's coming out soon. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, so no, that's good because we're running out of time because this group is so cerebral and you have 10,000 questions. So dun, 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 coming soon, there is an accompaniment to the high school CDA handbook. Bisa, say it one more time. Is the CDA, a high school CDA implementation guide. Yes, yes. And so a lot of what you're asking for is going to be in this implementation guide. So you guys stay tuned. And here's another stay tuned question that I know is important to you all. You, you all have spent your money on, many of you all on the second edition of the essentials and, and you're worried like, are my students going to be adequately prepared, right? to go and take the exam, right? Have their verification visit? The answer is yes. And some of you asked, how will I know what the differences are? Well, we have some good news for you on February 23rd, 2023 in our council link newsletter, stand by and stay tuned. They will outline all of the changes, right? That have occurred in the new edition in the third edition. And they want you to be assured that What's in the second edition and those minor changes will not affect your student's ability to be successful, right? And taking that test and doing that verification, right? In my own words that I like to use when I'm here and in the neighborhood, they still gonna be the bomb diggity, okay? Trust us with that. Um, another thing that we want you to know is that the registration for EELC has opened up our Early Learning Leaders Conference. It's very popular. Um, registration fills up quickly. And if I was you, I would pay attention because there's a good chance that there's going to be some good presentations and good information at that conference on high school CTE, okay? Um, Sandy, am I getting all the good stuff that you wanted me to, to, to cover? I don't want to leave you out. You've been quiet. Yeah, no, thank you for um, pulling me back in. I did want to, since we're talking about new things, I did want to bring up, we don't have an exact date yet, but the high school handbook is currently being translated in Spanish yes. and it will be available later this year, most likely in second quarter, but stay tuned um, and keep an eye out on our website as well as in counseling for that. And then just a reminder, we keep talking about this webinar. It's not going to be sent out immediately after this. It's going to be sent out tomorrow. So look for it tomorrow. Yeah, so they'll <laughs> get a link in the, the, they'll get a link to the presentation, link to the presentation in the, in the email that they registered for this webinar. Correct. All the registrants we're gonna, are going to get an email with, with a copy of the, the video of this, as well as a PDF of this actual presentation. Okay, well, team, we're at 431, so we're a minute over. So I just want to say for the collective, thank you again for your commitment to providing high-quality CTE, CDA experiences to our scholars across the country. What you do matters, what they do matters, and we know at the end of the day, what it means for young children and positive outcomes for them when they have a high quality prepared teacher and why not start early with our high schoolers, right? We're all in agreement with that. So have a great rest of the evening. We're going to get your questions answered and we look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.